I am Ankona, lecturer at Prashanta Chandra Mahalanatish Mahavidalar and on behalf of the Department of English, uh, a very good morning to everyone, to our distinguished speaker, Professor Amrit Shen from Department of English, Bishop Bharat University, our principal of Prashanta Chandra Mahalanatish Mahavidalar, Dr. Shamal Karnamokar, our IQAC coordinator, Dr. Kamula Mitro, my colleagues, and all participants present today. I take no further time to ask uh, uh, Dr. Shukanto Dash, Associate Professor, Prashanta Chandra Mahalanamish Mahavitalar, to deliver the introductory address. Thank you, sir. Um, thank you, Ankona. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir, you are. Okay. So, hello and uh, good morning to all of you there, the dear participants, our distinguished speaker, Professor Amrit Sen, the principal of our college, Dr. Sam Kormokar, sir, the IQC coordinator, Dr. Kamala Mitro, ma'am, and all our participants. I once again welcome you here. And Thank you for showing your int interest in the online lecture series that we have organized. And it is pretty interesting that despite the very fact that there are a certain issue of a digital divide, still we thought that on the part of our department, we should try to address the concern of our students. It is with this objective that we have tried to organize a series of lectures. Obviously, this is the first one of such projected lectures that we are going to organize. And so far as the registration is concerned, we have had certain interesting facts that 42% of the registered participants are the faculties of different college and universities across the country. 24% of the participants are UG students, 15% are from PG students, 20 from others. I, I welcome all of you here for the lecture that is to be delivered shortly. And as we are all struggling in this pandemic period, we thought that our students should not be deprived of the kind of very interesting lecture and, and ideas that are actually discussed by eminent academicians and scholars. It is with this objective that we have organized this particular lecture, this special lecture to be delivered by our distinguished Speaker, Professor Amrit Sen. Now, I will not take much time right now because we are all eagerly waiting to listen to the lecture to be delivered by our distinguished guest. Just one thing that I will share with you here is that uh, it is because of the technological innovation, though we are aware that there are certain uh, network issues and all that, and we in fact, uh, you know, seek your apology for any kind of disturbance that may take place in the course of this lecture and all that. Uh, now, it is pretty interesting that uh, we have registered participants from different far-flung areas of the country and from abroad, and the participants did not apply for visa, they did not take the trouble of uh, transport and all that to join this lecture. So you stay at home and enjoy the electrifying lecture that is to be delivered very shortly. And I wish you all the best and please cooperate with us. And I will look forward to your participation. And please remember that in the chat box, we will have the questions and please follow all the guidelines that we have actually uh, requested you to follow. So I once again welcome you and thank you very much for your participation. Thank you. Over to you, Ankona. 
Thank you, Dr. Dash, for the introductory uh, lecture. I now invite our principal, Dr. Shamul Kormokar, to to the, to the to deliver his welcome address. To you, Dr. Kormokar. Visible? Yes, sir. Visible? Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Good morning. I, Dr. Samuel Karmukar, Principal of Prasant Chandra Malanovish Mahavidalai. It's a moment of great privilege and honor for me to extend a hearty welcome to all of you, the students and participants today at this memorable event. I find immense pleasure in introducing our guest, Dr. Amrit Sen, the resource person of our program. I extend a warm welcome, warm welcome to him and proud to mention that our students will be in contact with such a personality who will encourage them to learn and think about English literature. Dr. Sen, now professor of English and other modern European language, Visobharati University, Santiniketan, he has won the outstanding thesis award for his book, The Narcissistic Mode, Metafiction as a Strategy in Mole Flanders, Tom Jones and Tristram Sandy. He is interested in traveling writing and owned the UGC Research Award for his project titled The Self and the World in Tagore's Traveling Writing. He also takes a keen interest in the history of science in India, especially the writings of Acharya Prabhupada Chandrade. I have enjoyed very much his lecture uploaded in YouTube, Community University Aesthetic, Rabindranath Pedagogy and the Festival, Panel Discussion, <coughs> probably 29th April 2012. We have entered already a new platform for lectures and workshops as the lockdown brought about by coronavirus. We feel proud and privileged to be a part of this innovative and vibrant team of Prasanthi Chandra Mahalavish Mahavidyalaya. We are relentlessly what we need students with educational workshops and seminars to upgrade their knowledge. We congratulate them for their noble endeavor. I am very happy to share that the IQAC of our college had already organized different webinars during this pandemic situation. We received a large number of responses from teachers, students, and research scholars. It has also become clear from their feedback that they, that the participants have been benefited by attending webinars. Today's webinar is based on popular literature, The Murder of Roger Ackroyd by Agatha Christie. And the title of the special lecture is Playing with the Form, The Murder of Roger Ackroyd, organized by Department of English under the guidance of IQAC of Prasant Chandra Mohan Vishma The Murder of Roger Ackroyd is a work of detective fiction by Agatha Christie, first published in June 1926 in the United Kingdom by William Collins Tons, and in the United States by Dot, Maid and Company. It is the third novel to feature Hercule Poirot as the lead detective. Now, go to our attractive session. This is all from my side. Thank you all for being patient listeners. Thank you, Dr. Kormukar, for the warm welcome and also for introducing our speaker. But I invite Dr. Dash now to introduce our speaker to the participants in a formal manner. To you, Dr. Dash. Um, hello, uh, good morning once again and welcome. Uh, though my job of uh, introducing Professor Amritsan has already been done to a great extent by our principal, sir, Dr. Samuel Kormokar. And I have been, in fact, asked by the distinguished speaker today that I said I shall restrict my, myself to the official terms and words in order to introduce uh, Professor Sen to our participants. That is, uh, here it goes. He is the professor and head department of English, Bisoharati and Bisoharati Santiniketan. And his areas of interest are 18th century literature, Tagore popular literature. 
now uh, this is what he has asked me to uh, you know talk about himself because he believes that uh, participants have registered themselves to hear about and listen to uh, agatha christie that is the murder of roger ackroyd but we all know that we are all looking forward to listen to that story yes but obviously from our distinguished uh, speaker that is professor amrit sen we know that he is, has mesmerized the participants the audience in different other webinars and lecture series uh, that the participants were fortunate enough to listen to i would therefore uh, feel uh, that you would enjoy the very lecture to be delivered by professor amrit sen so it's a matter of privilege and sheer joy on the part of the department of english to really introduce one of the distinguished and finest academicians of the country today and one of the quote and quote popular speakers of india professor amrit sen and i would now request our distinguished speaker professor amrit sen to move forward so over to you sir professor amrit sen thank you thank you can i begin yes please right uh, thank you shukanto for uh, those very kind words and thank you uh, professor kormukar for that very very touching uh, introduction in fact i am so so extremely moved that you have actually taken the time to uh, take a look at that youtube lecture which i delivered at azim premji university when you know digital uh, lectures were not so popular uh times have indeed flown and uh, here we are moving and hopping from a webinar to be to another now i would like to also start by thanking all my students and a lot of peers who have attended a lot of uh, these deliberations asked me questions there are people behind the scenes also my guardian guardian angels my students and friends who take the time to uh, you know prepare these powerpoints that uh, go a long way in addressing these issues so uh, my special thanks to these guardian angels who who uh, listen to almost every little uh, demand that i make on them by the way the powerpoint presentation today that i'm going to present uses uh, two images one is a uh, stamp that the british mail actually brought out in 2016 uh, six stamps actually which talk about or give different uh, pictures of agatha christie's uh, agatha christie's novels and uh, the other picture would be uh, embedded and that is a picture of agatha christie herself now uh, i can see that a large number of you have gathered here today and i take this uh to once again reiterate that all of you are here to because you share an interest in agatha christie and detective fiction and uh, i have been extremely extremely fortunate i myself being you know i read a detective fiction almost every day a new story or a thriller uh very fortunate in actually visiting the summer house of agatha christie in torquay in in england where a lot of his novels are set actually uh one of the novels said there is perilat end house which proved to be very popular so uh i actually felt thrilled when i visited the drawing room and touched the typewriter with which she you know thrashed out so many of these novels agatha christie was a very very you know very very extremely mm, prolific writer wrote almost every day and never allowed her manuscripts to be changed that's a interesting detail which uh, i learned there uh i would not waste much more time uh, and uh, begin with the lecture but uh, let me just clarify one thing that this is primarily meant for undergraduate students uh this was something which i designed when i was lecturing at uh, vishwabharati for my own students some of whom i can see uh on the um, on on the attending list and therefore 
there's no great research insight here, but I'm just trying to move from point to point and trying to alert you to the various uh, aspects of uh, the murder of Roger Ackroyd. Now, this uh, presentation has three parts. First and foremost, I talk about the context of the, of the cultural uh, aspect of uh, these fictions that is popular culture and try to situate uh, the novel within the broader ambit of popular culture, asking what popular culture does. The second is where I situate uh, the novel within a philosophical structure of how detective fiction works. And finally, what I'll do is I'll point out certain aspects of uh, Agatha Christie's novels. Now, as uh, 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 Dr. Kormukar has very kindly pointed out, the, the novel was published in 1926, third of the Poirot novels. Interestingly, 1926 was the time when Agatha Christie was undergoing a tremendous personal crisis. She would vanish for a few days, uh, weeks actually, in uh, 1926, registering herself at a hotel, uh, and then come back and get a divorce and marry again and continue to write. But what is popular culture, uh, therefore, and what are the what are the contexts in which I want to like to situate it? First and foremost, let's take a look at the historical overview of popular culture. Till the early modern, you see, popular culture is ritualistic and carnivalistic, primarily restricted to folk forms. Uh, you see, at this point, there's no, there's no print culture as such. So the difference between high elite courtly culture and popular culture is largely a matter of class. After the book, after print culture enters, there is an early movement towards segregation of different kinds of culture. But it is only with the, and many of my students will remember how I pushed them about, uh, into talking about Grub Street, that place which Dryden immortalizes in uh, Mac Fleckno, and uh, how Grub Street becomes that locus where you know, popular culture uh, thrives as opposed to the high courtly culture. But it is with the industrial and the modern societies that I see the evolution of a mass culture, which is consumed to a large extent. Interestingly, the novel, which is now so much a part of uh, high culture also, was very much a part of popular culture. In fact, Fielding talks about the novelist as an innkeeper who must you know, supply things to people as they demand. Now, with the postmodern and beyond, you know, popular culture actually takes over. There's no, the categories are blurred and it is the popular which has a gradual monopoly. So that's a historical, you know, uh, checkpoint of how popular culture has evolved. Now, I will use two or three theorists primarily because I would like to then launch into uh, Agatha Christie through them. And the first is Walter Benjamin, uh, the work of art in an age of mechanical reproduction. Uh, this being a 1935 uh, uh, text. And Benjamin talks about uh, mechanical reproduction as representing something new, where and Benjamin is talking about photographs, mass prints. And he says that, you know, what is lost in this is the presence of the individual hand of the the artist and therefore uh, Benjamin talks about, you know, different values, cult values and exhibition value. And he says that, you know, it's the exhibition value of, uh, of uh, the artifact that becomes more important. You see that it is mass produced, it is, it is, uh, it is distributed. What therefore is lost as Benjamin will talk about is the aura of art and uh, therefore Benjamin will talk about this question of whether mechanically reproduced <laughs> artworks lack authenticity and authority, right? So the aura of the work of art, Benjamin suggests, is lost in popular culture. And uh, therefore, Benjamin then talks about the film industry as uh, creating illusion promoting spectacles and dubious speculation uh, and thereby uh, creating forms which continuously repeat themselves and create an anesthetic effect upon the masses. This is what he 
uh, suggests is the operative strategy of popular culture. Students who are listening in will immediately recognize uh, that uh, this is something which links up with the next theorist that I'm using, Adorno and Horkheimer, the culture industry, which is part of, again, of the dialectic of enlightenment. This is a 1947 essay where uh, Adorno calls all artifacts where significance predominates over utility, cultural products. Adorno then talks about cultural products which made up popular culture, including film, horoscope, jazz, magazines, radio, Please remember the humble paji that you use in your household is a very important artifact of popular culture, the almanac. Uh, what Adorno suggests, and this is something which I use with detective fiction, is that the essential characteristic of the culture industry is repetition, a formula which is, you know, worked with, played with, but in its different guises, it is an endless sequence of repetition. And Adorno does this with, uh, by contrasting popular and serious music. You remember the song, Tama Tama Loge, Juma Chuma De De. It's a, you know, and now that people are listening in, my daughter included to remixes, it's popular culture standardizing and repeating itself. Therefore, standardization extends from the most general features as Adorno uh, and Horkheimer suggest, to the most specific ones. Remember this, that Agatha Christie, when she's using this, is not writing something you know, revolutionary. She is writing within a tradition. She is repeating what the tradition actually talks about, uh, what the tradition largely uh, uh, sort of presents over and over again. Now, Adorno and Hochheimer, of course, then suggests that popular culture does not trigger much, you know, uh, thinking. It is largely a product, something that is to be consumed. And therefore the audience uh, sort of drawn, all the possible reactions of the audience are actually embedded within the literary text itself. And therefore uh, it divests the listener, this process of standardization, divests the listener of his spontaneity and promotes conditioned reflexes. Now, when you start reading a detective fiction, you know what to expect. When you go to watch a romance, you know what to expect. You do not expect any revolutionary departure from that specific form. Even departures are somewhere conditioned within the structure. And therefore, uh, the most powerful industries uh, produce and market the mass culture, as Adorno suggests. And Adorno says that, you know, uh, literature's revolutionary function is somewhere uh, sort of eroded by popular culture or somewhere stifled by popular culture. Now, I will also go into a theory which I use very frequently when it comes to reading novels or watching films. And this is the theory of the game, right? You know, reading a detective novel is like playing a game between the author and the reader. And you see, the theory of the game suggests that the game has no ulterior utility apart from pleasure. It is a voluntary activity. It has certain fixed times, limits of time and place. Generally, you see, you read a detective novel at one go or across two or three uh, intervals. You do not take an inordinate time uh, to read a detective novel. There are certain rules which are accepted and more or less binding. You know, the author is expected to follow this rule. The reader is expected to follow this rule. And it is accompanied, the game is accompanied by a feeling of tension joy and consciousness that it is different from ordinary life. You know, my daughter often tries to play a game with me called life, where you actually collect points, you try to reach a certain destination. But while we are playing the game, we know that this is not life, that is a game. Now, 
there are several features of the game which I have pointed out here. But, uh, you see, why play the game is something which you must, you know, think about and think about a game that is very popular and very simple. And that is why it's popular. The game of Ludo. You know, you have certain rules. If you have a chokka, you cannot give five places. You have to, you know, go six places. You have emerging new situations. You know, situations change. You must, you know, cut off somebody's uh, dice. And then there must be a payoff. Somebody must win or lose. There must be a tension which is generated by the play. Right. Some games have skills. Others don't. Some have luck. But there is always in a game somebody who wins or loses. And this payoff, this pleasure of the game of playing and winning and losing is something that is integral to the process of reading also. So next time when you read a novel, when you watch a film, think about it in terms of a game. And this is what Lyotard does with his, uh, with his 90s work and he says that there are three he says that language there are various kinds of language games that we play and that uh, he suggests that language games equally have this system of contract you know you are expected to understand and respond in certain ways right if somebody says good morning to you and you say what is good about the morning that's not a very good language game to play even though it is a language game this, there is, of course, Lyotard says, infinite possibilities, but again, all these rules are subsumed within the, the broader aspect of the language game, and that every utterance that we make, therefore, every discourse that we perform is therefore a move in the game. Understand this very carefully, because these are the three major theorists with which I am going to enter into the ambit of popular culture. You see, young students, you must really know what are the theoretical approaches to the fiction that you are reading. Right. Uh, this is something which is slightly more detailed. You can take a look at that. But uh, I would rather move on to the next slide, which talks about the crime, which talks about crime and the novel. You see, crime is integral to the novel. And uh, the right back to the originary, no origi originary moments of the English novel, if you take, you know, the Picaresque, for example, Gil Blas, one of the major, or Lazarillo, for example, the Spanish Picaresque. You see, the Picaro is a rogue. So crime is important for the novel. Why is it important once again? You see, go back to Bindashago. Uh, go back to a text like Borno Purichoy, where, you know, Rakhal and Gopal are the two characters. You see, you don't want to read about Gopal. Gopal is a Shubhud Balok, right? He, his adventures provoke no delight. The novel is, reading a novel is an act of pleasure more than utility, right? Therefore, Rakhal is the character of the novel. Therefore, Tom Jones is the character of the novel. Moll Flanders is the character of the novel. And therefore, crime is embedded. Crime, uh, the, the pleasure that, you know, crime generated in the 18th century is also integral to the novel. And even in the 19th century, you know, legality, deviance, crime, punishment, these are all aspects of the history of the novel and is integrated within it. And the novel, remember, was integral to the formation of, and this you need to understand, the, the uh, penal act, penal and penitentiary act of the 18th century. You see, earlier, the jail was a place where you were just, you know, kept locked up for some time. You were not supposed to be reformed. If you go to Alipur jail, it is not called a jail. It's called a Shongshodhanagar. Therefore, the novel created, you know, situations where innocent people were led into crime and therefore had to be reformed. And therefore, there was this narrative about jailing and reforming. So 
My point being that the novel and crime are not only integrally related, but one affects the other. You see, it's not just that the novel reflects crime or represents crime. It is also that the criminal system is narrativized by the novel. This is something which you need to understand. Now, let me come to the theory or the philosophy of detection. Those of you who read your Feludas and your Bomkishes and your Conan Doyles with great interest, have you ever thought who is the operative philosopher of crime fiction? And that is Descartes. Descartes' Discourse and Method was published in 1670. And you see, it reads almost like a manual for a detective. Right. So what does Descartes say? And I'm quoting Descartes from the text. The first is never to accept anything for true, which I do not clearly know to be such. So what does the detective first say? Everybody is uttering falsehood. Nothing is true. Everybody is a suspect. Right. So clearly and distinctly to exclude all ground of doubt. Right. So the first thing that the detective does is doubt. Dubito, according to Descartes. The second that Descartes suggests is to divide each of the difficulties into as many parts as possible. So the, what the detective does is breaks down the process of detection into several you know, component problems. Motive of the crime, opportunity of the crime, and the actual you know, time and place and clues of the crime. The third that the detective does is to conduct thoughts in such order that by commencing with the objects, the simplest and easiest is to know, I might ascend by little and by little. So little clues lead through causality to more deduction, to more complex solutions, and finally the total solution. And the last in every case in which the detective must make is to make enumerations so complete, reviews so general, that I might be assured that nothing was omitted. So at the end, the denouement, when the detective explains his case, he must tie up all the loose strings. No left, you know, unexplained. You see, when you read your detective fictions, you are actually going back to a Cartesian philosophy. Of course, with the Cartesian philosophy, the detective also uses the empirical motive of looking for clues, moving from primary ideas to secondary ideas. But therefore, what I'm suggesting is that the detective is a very child enlightenment. You know, unless there is enlightenment, unless there was a possible. Right. Now let's talk about the features of the detective story. Now these are features which your teachers have talked to you about, you have talked in class about, and this is something which Van Dyme talks about, the 20 features of the detective fiction. Crime often most often murder is committed early in the narrative. I will talk about murder a little bit. Because, you know, why murder is another question. A variety of suspects with different motives. Central character acts as a detective. Detective collects evidence, interviews the suspects, solves the mystery, and the criminal is arrested or otherwise punished. You see, this last phase is very important. You see, the criminal has to be identified, but the criminal has to be arrested. You know, when the detective sort of leaves the criminal, then the detective fiction becomes problematic, right? Because detection and the detective fiction is also embedded in not only in questions of law, it is also embedded in questions of morality and the social structure. Now, this is once again Van Dyne talking about, uh, and Simons talking about working back from the effect. So you actually have the effect first, the murder. And then you go back to the motive, right? So from the solution to the problem, 
The effect is the crime and the narrative action consists in working back from the crime to identify the cause of the crime, right? So it's very interesting because the other major uh, theorist to, you should read actually, is Setvan Todorov. Todorov has this 1966 essay called The Typology of Detective Fiction, where Todorov talks about the detective fiction telling us two stories. One is the story of the crime, and the second is the story of the detection of the crime. You see, what is more important in the detective fiction is the second story, the story of the detection of the crime. That is the operative story. And that operative story will then lead us back to the earlier story only, right? So it's very interesting in the way various narratives crisscross within detective fiction. Think about this carefully. Now, uh, it's very interesting. You see, I had once interviewed one of the leading, you know, Bengali uh, detective fiction writers also. You know, you have seen probably the Shabor films. Uh, that is Shishendu Mukhopadhyay. And Shishendu Babu, in a very candid statement, actually talked to me about, you know, the detective as not existing at all. What did he mean by that? You know, detectives as advertised in the pages of the Anandobajar Putrika are merely working in very, very little uh, cases of, you know, following people or knowing about whether you have had affairs before your marriage. You know, most of the detectives, if you come across them, actually are uh, engaged in finding out whether wives are having adulterous affairs or how good a woman or a man is for marriage. You know, whatever, what history he has. Detectives almost never solve any crimes. So the detective is a fictional product, a largely fictional product. If there is a detective, there is a police detective. And those police narratives are direct police procedurals. Many of you probably see the uh, iconic television show CID. There's of course other shows, but the, actually it's the police detective. The fictional amateur detective study who is actually a literary you know, character. He's an amateur. He's not in the official police force. You know, you almost always have him outside the police. He might at times, but he's outside the police force. <coughs> Interestingly, many of you are already thinking about Poirot. Poirot is a consulting detective who was once part of the Belgian police force. In fact, those of you who have seen the last film of Poirot, which was so brilliantly made by Kenneth Branagh, Branagh actually talks about his distant past as a priest. So from priest to policeman, to detective. But please remember this, that the fictional detective is very infrequently a policeman. Is very often, more often than not, an amateur. In fact, all, almost all Bengali detectives are amateurs. And therefore, the possession on the part of the detective of a vast knowledge base and acute capacity for observation, stringent deduct deductive and inferential logic. So, you see, when Sherlock Holmes comes to the, to the forefront, he's actually publishing papers <coughs> on chemistry, on the quality, on the number of poisons that are there, on the number of, you know, cigarette ashes that might be present so the, the detective is an empiricist, he deducts, and he possesses a knowledge base about poisons, for example, which is a very frequent motive of murder. <clears throat> and very importantly, this detective is somebody who is exceptional. He, have you ever wondered why you know, a detective is almost always eccentric? He has, to be, he has to be distinguished from the common man. Now, it's interesting that uh, some detectives are common individuals, but most detectives have to be given a certain 
exceptional quality. And that is why most of them are eccentrics, right? He's, he has to be narratively set apart. That is why Poirot with his very structured mustache. Immediately, when you think of a detective, remember, you think about a distinguishing feature. And therefore, I am emphasizing this again and again, that the detective is largely a fictional narrative product manufactured by the author rather than in real life. That's the fictional detective. Right. The official police force, of course, is either stupid or largely uncooperative. In certain cases, they can cooperate with the detective. You think about Lestrade, for example. You think about uh, Officer Jap, for example. You think about the various detectives who plague uh, various police officers who uh, sort of hinder Bonkish, for example. Right. Then, of course, there's the detective's confidant. Right. And this is Watson. This is Hastings. This is Ajit. This is Topshe, who is slightly less intelligent. You see, the detective's intelligence is set off or set apart, really, by the confidant's lack of this intelligence. A suspect who appears to be guilty from circumstantial evidence, this is what is called the red herring, you know. You, the narrative will lead you into a misdirection until and unless the detective can lead you back to the proper direction. And then there's a significant quality of irrelevant information. Please remember that one of the cardinal rules that Van Dyne suggests is that the reader must have access to all the information that the detective has. You see, the reader must be part must be a surrogate detective. Otherwise, you see, when you're playing this game, that is why I go back to the game theory. When you, when you are playing this game, you are actually a surrogate detective. You are actually entering the narrative process and trying to find with the detective who the real criminal is until and unless this is done. You know, suddenly some revelation, suddenly some miraculous event, this will not you know, be a good detective story. And then, of course, there's this resolution where you gather people together, the detective gathers the people together and reveals a startling and unexpected resolution and bringing the culprit to justice, right? Of course, when we talk about the history of the detective fiction, you talk about the one figure which dominates, you know, Sherlock Holmes, although, you know, it starts with Poe and then moves along within the French tradition. But the detective is, of course, Sherlock Holmes. Uh, 1887, the first uh, novelette appears till 1893 when Moriarty and he uh, and Sherlock Holmes are engaged in this conflict. Conan Doyle kills him off. People actually wear armbands, black armbands in public, and by demand, Holmes is brought back in 1901 with the Hound of the Baskervilles. Right. Uh, but there are two trends here. One is the close, the lowbrow, uh, which has this conservative ideological function, which I'll talk about with Christy. Close story, happy ending, good reading, and provides reassuring security to the reader that society will continue in the form the reader knows and likes. Now, there is a thesis here, which sort of looks at why the detective fiction rose when the detective fiction rose. That is to say, you know, uh, just prior to the First World War, you see, people have suggested that the World War actually created a rupture in the social fabric. So everything was turned topsy-turvy. So you needed a narrative form that would set things in order that would bring a kind of an order to the chaos and therefore the rise of detective fiction. By the way, uh, T.S. Eliot appears to be one of the first great fans of detective fiction. Uh, the main development pathway of this, you know, happy, lowbrow, whodunit tradition, which is often called the cozy mystery, is from Poe through Doyle to the Golden Age, including Agatha Christie and Dorothy Sayers, 
But very importantly, what this also means is that in this, you know, cozy mystery, there's never a great threat to the social fabric. There's never great violence, you know. And you have this suggestion that, you know, the murder will ultimately be solved. Society will once again return to status quo. But the second and the more minor movement was the critical trend, which emerged with the American hard-boiled school. You have Dashiell Hamnett, Raymond Chandler, and the others, uh, which brings in what we will call the thriller into the detective fiction genre, where there's a lot of bloodshed, where there's uh, enormous you know, social crime, you know, society is threatened by this violence, the bloodshed is, is qualitatively much more. And here there are certain departures and there are certain ways in which the authors play around with various ideas. And I and talk about Kafka, Borges, Robert Grille, feminist writing, Ruth Rendell, for example, might be a favorite uh, for many of you. Umberto Eco, for example, The Name of the Rose, where the entire you know, form of the detective fiction is turned inside out. You know, you have, you know, multiple murderers and, uh, and the entire question becomes uh, the question of how literature functions rather than how the detective solves the crime. So this, these are the two traditions. Uh, the fictional private detective about whom I just mentioned, therefore has a new professional role. You see, these are consulting detectives working for a fee. Please don't forget this. Bomkesh has a check. Jeta dekheta chok dhadiye jach. Right? His eyes are dazzled by the amount. But that fee of the professional detective points to him as a new middle class professional who engages with crime and rationality. Right? He is the middle class, he symbolizes the middle class, market-oriented professional, striving to create and maintain socioeconomic status in the congested urban environment. And you see how Shotojit Roy and uh, Sharodindu both, you know, bring this detective down to the middle class uh, milieu. All right, but the major function of the detective being to ensure that any rupture in the socioeconomic fabric must be controlled and contained, right? He, uh, you know, and the, the royalty, nobility and the bourgeois are not infrequent in their recourse to his services, right? So he is somebody who is consulted by all classes of society and he often maintains the status quo also in the gentry as well, even in certain cases, for example, in Sherlock Holmes or Hercule Poirot, they work for the government to ensure that the, the political system of the day is preserved and that there is no great revolution or upheaval. In fact, detective fiction is almost always extremely suspicious of revolutionaries. Now, why murder? You see, almost 42% of Agatha Christie's uh, stories have a murder by poisoning. Almost 68% of the stories are about murders, right? A murder of Roger Ackroyd, murder at Stiles, uh, murder on the Orient Express, murder, she wrote, right? Why? Because murder carries an atavistic weight of repugnance, fascination, and fear. You see, when you and many of you have been brought up on the Harry Potter series. Remember that murder is the moment when Dumbledore says you rip your soul apart. It is that crime which cannot be reversed. It is that crime which provokes most fascination and fear. It, you know, you can reform after you have committed a theft, right? But when you commit a murder, you enter into a zone from which reformation is hardly possible. You cannot give back the life that you have taken. Right. So uh, it cannot be, the person cannot be revived, which makes murder the most thrilling crime. And therefore, it is the greatest slur, the greatest rupture that you can do to society. And that is why 
a horcrux must be made only when a murder is committed. And that is why Voldemort's ultimate soul will shrink to that size, which you remember in that final episode in uh, Harry Potter. Now, uh, I'll just quickly uh, sort of refresh this very dense uh, talking session with a few manuscripts. That's Arthur Conan Doyle's handwriting. And you can see how Conan Doyle was extremely particular about detective fiction writers are actually very particular about the manuscripts. They're very neat people and they don't like changes made in the manuscript at all. By the way, Agatha Christie was not the first person to bring the first female detective. In fact, this was done by somebody called Andrew Forrester. Uh, the first female detective, which was called the female detective, 1864. So you see, the female, the tradition of the female detective is quite an old tradition. And, uh, you know, this lady is called Mrs. Gladden. So somewhere she anticipates Mrs. Marple. Now, that is Mrs. Marple. That's the, I bring this slide in so that I can show you how Agatha Christie's contemporaries, you know, envisioned Mrs. Marple. And you can see that old lady who's knitting her, uh, her stuff. And it, her, it sort of uh, is made in these journals, as it were, her first appearance. Right. And then, of course, comes Agatha Christie. That's the picture that I use. It is the brain, the little gray cells, which one must rely. One must see the truth within, not without. Once again, see that the detective is a product of the enlightenment because he prioritizes mind over matter, even though the clues are important. You see, it is the detective who talks about the pure mind's uh, ability to solve all problems. The, the operative detective here is uh, Mycroft Holmes, you know, Sherlock Holmes's brother, elder brother, who never leaves the chair. He can actually solve all problems through the chair. And you see, Mrs. Marple, Hercule Poirot are not very robust detectives, are they? They don't run around looking for clues, right? So it's the brain, it's the little gray cells, the triumph of mind over matter that once again, philosophically links uh, detective fiction to Descartes. Let me now come to the man whom all of you have been waiting for, Hercule Poirot. And uh, if you take a look at Hercule Poirot, and that, that there's the on the left hand side, you will find that the picture, you know, immaculately dressed Hercule Poirot, immaculately moustached, uh, bald head like an egg, right? And certain mannerisms. In fact, Poirot, if you look at him psychologically, psychoanalytically, is a great candidate for, you know, OCD. He has obsessive compulsive disorder. In fact, uh, you remember that episode in uh, The Murder on the Orient Express, where he will have his eggs only and only if they are properly sized. All the eggs are identical. He cannot, you know, find any, he cannot tolerate any, uh, uh, any any disturbance within the ordered sequence. So a detective, incidentally, if you look at him psychoanalytically, is marked by this OCD. He has to notice the difference in the pattern so that he can address and cure it. He can address and restore it immediately. So when you are looking at a, at a detective, also take this, this, take a look at him psycho, psychologically. This is, of course, David Shushe, the, the Hercule Poirot, who's sort of starred, you know, you, you remember Peter Ustinov and David Shushe as the, the major, you know, characters who played, uh, Def, uh, I'm sorry, uh, well, Defoe and Crusoe come to be naturally, so uh, Poirot. This is Kenneth Branagh. And Kenneth Branagh, incidentally, while he was prepping for, for, for Poirot, actually talked about the aspects, the different aspects that he was prepping as, that moustache, for example, that hair, of course, here, uh, Poirot has hair, the, the, you know, the rose that he carries on the heart, the immaculate uh, dressing sense, the cane that he carries once again. These are all aspects of Hercule Poirot. You, you, that is how Christie actually sets her 
detective apart. You see, let me come back to Adorno and Horkheimer. The detective is a standard figure, standardized figure. But every detective writer must give a degree of autonomy or difference to the character. How does one do that? One creates certain peculiarities in character. And that is how Agatha Christie will add the peculiarity to Poirot. Right. You see, once again, you have to, you have to visualize Poirot. That hat, that moustache. And these are some of the early illustrations, actually, of the Poirot, uh, Poirot uh, novels. In fact, it's very interesting if you look at these first pictures of the first editions, which Agatha Christie herself was uh, taking part in design. You know, this is how Agatha Christie wanted her Poirot cover to be. So she is herself pointing out to this distinction of the detective while being part of the process of standardization. Of course, 33 novels, 59 short stories, one original play, you can take two if you want, three continuation novels by Sophie Hanna. In fact, August 2020, Sophie Hanna's fourth novel, The Killings at Kingfisher Hill, will be published. I have read, of course, all three of Hannah's novels which feature Hercule Poirot, and I can tell you that Hannah is somewhat of a, of a disappointment after, after Christie. Okay, now, once again, why is the detective so distinctive? Why must he be made so distinctive? This is a question which I want, I want you to think about after the lecture. You know, I have tried to answer this question, but you go back, you think of what are the distinguishing features of the detective that you read, right? For example, Niharajo, when he talks about Kiriti Lai, is creating a detective who is, who is extremely Western. Whereas Shorodindu, when he's creating his detective is, you know, is Bumkesh has Malkocha Maradhuti, right? So he's sort of indigenizing the detective. Think about Shibram Chakraborty, for example, who writes a detective fiction based on a fictional character called Kolke Kash, right? Who's rendering the detective in a comic way, right? So every detective, however standardized he might be and however standardized the detective fiction, every detective is distinct Otherwise, you cannot have a coherent series of detective fictions, right? Now, the first description of Poirot was by Hastings in The Mysterious Affair at Stiles. Hardly more than five feet, four inches, carries himself with great dignity. Head was the, exactly the shape of an egg. Perched it on one side. You can say that I'm taking off a little bit from Poirot, of course, my head has a shock of hair which has, needs a little bit of treatment. But, well, given time, I'll soon become as bald as Poirot, I guess. The neatness of his attire being incredible, a speck of dust would have caused him more pain than a bullet wound. Looks ridiculously full of his own importance. The detective also, and you see most detectives are extremely, you know, self-confident they must have confidence in their abilities to solve the crime. See, Bomkesh, in one of those stories, if you remember, tells the Kumar, Kumar Tridivendra Nana and Rai, that I'll solve the question, uh, the, 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 the case in seven days. He has to have that self-confidence in his abilities. Uh, and then, of course, Mrs. Marple, and Mrs. Miss Marple, I'm sorry, Miss Marple makes this very interesting statement the wicked murderer, Inspector Neil, he says, and the wicked should not go unpunished. That is the mantra of the detective. You see, morally, you know, the detective must not allow immorality to exist. Now, there are cases when the detective lets the murderer go, but it has to be extremely judiciously thought about as to whether, you know, the murderer created or prevented a far greater crime from happening, right? So this autonomy of the detective to make a moral decision, 
is a very important aspect. But by and large, the structure of detective fiction means that the detective must adhere to the moral fabric of society. He must restore it. He must preserve it. And therefore, however radical detective stories might be, the detective is an extremely conservative individual in that sense of the term. And detective fiction happens to be one of the most conservative features or one of the most conservative forms of literature. Right. And then, you know, Miss Marple is fluffy and dithery in appearance, inwardly as sharp and shrewd. But then, very importantly, Mrs. Uh, well, let me come back to Miss Marple a little later on, but let me just talk about the murder of Roger Ackroyd for a moment, and because students otherwise will feel that I'm straying far away from the text that they have read. I will, of course, assume that since you studied for the semester but never appeared for it, or will probably not appear for it, you have read the story, right? Now, Agatha Christie in 1938 talked about Roger Ackroyd as being one of Poirot's favorite cases. He was at his best investigating crime in a quiet country village, using his knowledge of human nature to get at the truth. You see, that's what I was trying to point out. Both Poirot and Miss Marple talk about human nature as being everywhere the same. You see, you have to think about the space of the detective fiction. Very often, the Agatha Christie murders, uh, or the stories, actually take place in a village, small village. Why? One of the major reasons being that Agatha Christie herself stayed in such a village in Torquay. So she was writing to her strength. She was writing about the place where she actually stayed most of her times when she wrote these novels. But the other statement that they make is that human nature is everywhere more or less the same. So once again, you see standardization of human nature, whether it be urban, whether it be rural, now, this is quite distinctive because if you look at the home stories, if you look at the Bengali detective stories, detective fiction is most predominantly an urban genre. There are certain urban crimes that the detective, in fact, the crimes are urban. Feluda very infrequently travels to the country, right? Most crimes that Feluda solves are fundamentally taking place in urban centers. But Agatha Christie makes this very interesting departure. She locates it within the village and suggests that there's no difference between the village and the city in terms of the psychology of human nature. Right. Now, what are the sources? You probably know this already, but let me reiterate that her brother-in-law, James Watt of Abney Hall, actually talked to her about the criminal being a Dr. Watson character, in this case, Dr. Shepherd, who narrates the story, is the criminal, right? And that's what is called a spoiler, right? But since you already know the story, you see, in doing so, Agatha Christie is actually violating Van Dyne's norms that the narrator should not be the criminal. But in this case, Agatha Christie makes the narrator the criminal. And she repeats this formula once again, you know, in a text like The Mousetrap, which is the single largest running uh, theater show. I wanted to go and see this. But I couldn't get the tickets for that. So The Mousetrap, once again, that the detective or the policeman, who poses as the policeman rather, is actually the criminal, right? So in that sense, that is the major departure. That is the most radical play with the form that Agatha Christie does. Of course, there's also this suggestion that this was advocated by sundry other characters, but let us, including Lord Mountbatten, but uh, I will stick to this source. Right. So, novel first received its true publication as a 54-part serialization in the London News, and the title initially was Who Killed Ackroyd? Right. <clears throat> the location is, of course, the village King's Abbot, the Country house is called Fernley Park. And you see, all these towns, all these small towns in Agatha Christie, including, 
of course, her great novel, uh, the ABC Murders, are these small, small towns, small villages. Uh, big town is Cranchester. We have a large railway station, a small post office, two rival general stores. So a very traditional English village, uh, which do not have many able-bodied men. There are no, no great young men in Agatha Christie. Most of them are slightly aged. Uh, retired military officers, of course, this is one important aspect, you know, colonial officers having served in India and then retired to uh, the country, the country and the hobbies and recreations can be summed up as uh, Agatha Christie says gossip. Now, I could have launched into this gossip and the question of truth and the ontological differences between gossip and truth, which Roger Ackroyd actually uh, sort of uses, Agatha Christie uses, and Agatha Christie keeps on telling us that without fire, there is no smoke. So the ontological status of gossip as liminal between, placed between truth and fiction is something which Agatha Christie probes in her novels. But I will restrict myself here to just mentioning this. You can take this up as a research question later on uh, as to how gossip operates and what are the modalities of gossip in who gossips, these are the old ladies, who leads to these gossips are the maids, the invisible people, the drivers and the maids before whom we can bear our all, but we do not realize how gossip goes around. So there's an entire you know, discourse about gossip that uh, Agatha Christie sort of adumbrates in uh, the novels that she writes, and most importantly in uh, this particular novel. Let me just keep myself, restrict myself there since I have little time. But uh, gossip forms a very important part of this entire discourse of the, of the detective fiction. Many, of course, have the red herrings. In fact, uh, that is what narratively Poirot says. It's, it's extraordinarily intriguing, this whole thing. And that every new development, this is a classic strategy of detective fiction. This is taken from Roger Ackroyd, of course, you might remember these quotations. It's like a shake you give to the kaleidoscope. The thing changes entirely in its as aspect. So, you know, the detective moves on from suspect to suspect. For example, Ralph Payton, Ursula. Uh, you have, of course, Charles Kent, the drug addict son of Elizabeth Russell, and so on and so forth. So the reader is playing this game once again, moving from suspect to suspect, examining whether, you know, he's making the right judgment. Right. And then, of course, comes this question of narrative deception. Now, you see, this is, this is the originality. Uh, this is the originality of the novel, this narrative deception. Uh, the The phrase that James Shepherd utters. The letter had been brought in at 20 minutes to nine. Uh, when I left him, the letter still unread. I could think of nothing, wondering if there was anything I had left undone. So when you, Michael once mentioned that a detective fiction has two, you know, the reader has two readers within him. One which you're reading for the first time. So when you're reading this for the first time, you do not know the impact or the impact of this particular fic line. But when you've read the novel and you come back to it, you realize that the narrator has played a trick on you. These are the traps. These are the narrative traps that Tagatha Christie and the detective writer must slip in very unobtrusively within the fiction. He must tell you that he must give you the clue, but you must not be able to decipher it. This is the narrative deception. If, you, if there is one particular phrase in this entire story, which is very important, this is this. And then, of course, we have already talked about the overarching human nature, which is the same across town and city. Human nature always interesting. It is curious to see how certain types always tend to act in exactly the same way. You see, one of the things that you must know about Agatha Christie is that her crimes are very, very, you know, standard, you know, restricted. There are no, there's no great range of Agatha Christie's 
criminals. The series that is a departure is murder in Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia for example, when she went there to Egypt with her archaeologist husband. But by and large, Agatha Christie restricted herself to known locales, to standard stories. So despite being great fans of Agatha Christie, if you take a long look at the series, you will find that her, her characters and her stories are quite repetitive. So why is she so popular? She's so popular because she's so simple. If you take a look at that language that Agatha Christie writes, you know, and a language that is extremely engaging, it gives us very significant information without very directly intruding upon our consciousness. The flow of language is extremely simple. The dialects of the particular characters are, you know, very well worked out. But if you look at the range of characters in Agatha Christie, they're very standard. You know, you have very little departures in them. That is the magic of Agatha Christie. Despite being so, you know, restricted as a writer, how did Agatha Christie become so popular? Right. Of course, I've talked about ideology and I keep on reiterating this for students that detective fiction in itself is one of the most conservative of forms, just like the romance, you know, uh, that there is always a resolution of conflicts. There is uncertainty. Roger Ackroyd's house is full of impostures and anxiety styles in the first novel is also one, a hotbed of you know, jealousy and unease. And Agatha Christie's criminals, they are traitors to the class in the sense that they violate the codes of that class. And therefore, their identification is an exercising the threat that the society nervously anticipates within its own membership, right? So, you see, it's very interesting in this competitive individualist world, there is always the suspicion that we may cross the threshold in terms of morality and behavior. You see, that is ingrained within industrial society because our needs are so much and because the social societal structures have become fluid, there's always this ingrained threat within society itself that borders might be crossed. So in a way, detective fiction is an expression of the anxieties of a growing capitalist industrial world. Think about these in these terms, that how the fiction itself, the form itself is an anxiety, an anxiety of resolution, an anxiety of behavior. This is what you know, in many ways, this relates to the role of the detective and detective fiction to that of folklore, right? And what is the function of folklore? Explain the world, protect the folk against psychic and physical threats, to offer escapist entertainment and be socially normative, to urge that these values will keep society on an even keel, resist disconcerting change. In fact, it's very interesting that, you know, Poirot often refers to himself as Papa Poirot, right? But the figure whom you can talk about is the, knight, the medieval license and protecting IT against encroachment and possible violation. The detective's knight armor is his intelligence. And so there's a very distinct differential categorization of the hero here, the protagonist. No longer is he athletic or extremely rustfully physical. The detective is marked by, you know, his, his intelligence, his, his stature as this knight is the cognitive. And therefore, you see, when you think even about a character like Sherlock Holmes, Holmes is somebody who, very interestingly, is drugged most of the times. He's in his drugged stupor. He takes 
heroin, he injects heroin himself, right? And you can see Holmes, you know, Watson being extremely, you know, uh, very often stirred by Holmes's laziness, by Holmes's ability to merely restrict himself to the chair and is still. Poirot himself has no major running around to do. In fact, wherever he runs around, he's extremely uh, disturbed. He's, <coughs> he's uh, travel sick, as it were. Mrs. Marple, of course, stays within the village. It doesn't venture out much. So a new kind of a folklore, a new kind of a heroism that the detective is bringing to the literary form. Of course, there's this question of class again. While Christie's characters are largely middle class and often leisured, class consciousness is a feature of all social groups in her universe. <coughs> you very rarely have a maid who commits a crime. In fact, the maids are the victims of Agatha Christie's uh, detective fictions. You don't have a criminal who comes from the outside. The criminals are all insiders from within the class. And therefore, again, you see, anxieties of detective fiction, is, it's not the anxieties of the, of the thriller. The detective fiction has its own special anxieties within itself, right? And the police are shown into the dining room rather than into the drawing room, in scrupulous recognition of their being in between status as neither gentlemen nor commoners. Think of the policemen, you know, who you see every day, neither commoners nor gentlemen in between status, the detective, also has this in-between liminal status. What is Christie's method? These are concluding slides. When asked about her method, she says, you start with the wish to deceive and then work backwards. So you see, deception is at the heart of crime. Detect deception is at the heart of detection as well, of the process of writing detective fiction. When the detective fiction is being written, you are therefore actually following a given trajectory, right? Uh, the denouement, of course, this is once again taken from the murder of Roger Ackroyd. This is the great moment, the moment of the climax, when the logic leads to the only one possible solution, Dr. Shepard, right? You see how definitive, look at the punctuation there. Look at the structure of the sentencing there, right? You, it leads only to one possible deductive solution, right? Uh, <clears throat> of course, the authorial deception, uh, you, why is Roger Ackroyd such a very typical novel in, uh, or atypical novel as it were in the Christie can because it's to be the criminal, right? Uh, everybody seems to have a secret uh, the production of which is imperative in fitting into place the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. And therefore, the tale may be recommended as one of the cleverest and most original of its kind. This is one of the first reviews of the text. Uh, once again, radical in form, the supreme, the ultimate detective fiction, the most elegant of all twists, the narrator who is revealed to be the murderer. The twist is not merely a function of the plot, puts the whole concept of detective fiction on our nature and sculpts it into a dazzling new shape. But please remember that once Christie has sculpted it into a new shape, that is repeated ad nauseum. You know, it becomes a trope which uh, is used in detective fiction time and time again. It was not an entirely new idea, nor was it entirely her own idea, but it was something which she set into motion as being another popular you know, uh, departure within the language games that detective fiction played. I once again suggest to you that you treat this process of reading the detective fiction, all detective fictions as language games and see how despite being you know, different, actually it's be writing the same story over and over again. So my last point here, this is the last slide. The more you read, beat your Bomkesh, beat your Kiriti, beat your Poirot, beat your Sherlock Holmes, or be it even uh, Nancy Drew, or for that matter, whatever detective is coming up nowadays. Uh, um, one of my favorite used to be some, somebody uh, called Professor Nutbull to Chokro, 
written by Odrish Bordon, who sought to weave in the scientist as detective. Ultimately, the more you read, the more things remain the same in the classical who done it. And that is where detective fiction becomes an extremely formulaic, an extremely, uh, you know, a genre where the process of playing the game remains the same. You can identify the differences. You can identify the salient aspects of the detective. That is different. But when Christie plays, she plays with the form, but the form remains largely the same. Thank you very much. Uh, I have an assignment today of evaluation at some of the places. Uh, so I will leave only if you do. Uh, let me know what the three questions are. If there are any remaining questions and you want to interact, my email address is given. I generally respond to emails. Right. Uh, just one more thing to add. If you are interested tomorrow, I'm speaking once again on Rabindranath and China. So in these very difficult times when the Chinese connection is becoming uh, a problem, I will take the questions and Christy. Thank you. Um, Thank you, uh, session for the brilliantly enriching uh, lecture. You have brought under one roof such difficult theories of Lyotard and Adorno and Horkheimer and whatnot, and also talking about how little stories are uh, work behind grand narratives and also gossip. So we have a question on gossip. Rishi Pal asks whether uh, if you could please discuss the question of doubt and truth uh, where readers as the detective and the detection as a kind of reading as gaining knowledge sort of uh, through a sort of mathematical uh, method involving proof and paradox. If you could answer to that. The question is there on the chat box. You can also you see, uh, if I start answering that question, I'll require one more hour. I think uh, what Rishidaj is pointing out once again is, see, there's one little thing which I, which I would, which I would like to sort of explain here, is that uh, Rishidaj is going back to Descartes' mathematical, uh, uh, Descartes being a mathematician, of course. You will remember that the Cartesian XY coordinates are called Cartesian coordinates because of Descartes. And once again, it's the mathematician who sort of uh, takes possibilities and fixes through certain formulas, uh, deriving certain formulas at one particular solution. But before he can arrive at, he must prove that the other solutions do not work. You see, that's the, 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 the principle of mathematics is that, you know, all proofs, all proofs must uh, be must be had. There must be no possible solution which will violate this principle, right? So when you write QED, therefore proved, you know, there's no other explanation for this. And therefore, yes, Rishidaj, doubt is the first principle of both mathematics and detective fiction and or rather the process of detection but you see and therefore you know in a large way detective fiction has this has this association with the mathematical process as as it were you know remember your theorems in geometry therefore 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 proved right since this is this this is this this is this therefore proved now uh, Thank God I got out from geometry when I could. But uh, you see, when you talk about literature, I think there is one gray area which we need to think about. And this is where the detective has something beyond the solution. You see, with mathematics, the, with the solution, the narrative ends. Right. Everybody is satisfied until and unless a new challenge is thrown to it. But with the detective, there's one more with the narrative, there's one more step. Right. What does one do with the solution? You see, that is where 
you will see that the greatest detective fictions will put us into that or not even us the detective also in that one moment when he will ask what is to be done with the criminal right and that is the area that where literature will escape the formulaic and thereby become a greater classic see that is where i think the answer to your question lies otherwise this you know this is larger question of moral doubt right and that is therefore the answer to the question right thank you amrita thank you rishidaj i i will take this up because that is an extremely intelligent question but i think i'll restrict today's answer to this this part right please sure thank you thank you thank, thank you sir uh, now i would like our iqac uh, coordinator dr komala mitro to deliver the keynote address i mean uh, the uh, the ending note Mitro, we are not the audible. You are not audible. To you, Doctor Mitro. Hello, am I? Yes. On behalf of IQAC. i take this opportunity to convey my gratitude to our principal sir dr sabul karmakar who has always been motivating us with his unrelenting zeal to pursue excellence in academic field thank you sir very much for your guidance and support on behalf of the organizing department at iqac i express my heartiest gratitude to our distinguished speaker of this program professor amrit sen professor and head of the department of english vishwabharati shantiniketan i thank him for his kind acceptance of our invitation despite his very tight schedule this is an absolute pleasure and honor for us to host him thank you very much professor sen again i must mention deep sense of appreciation to the head of the department of english shukant dash for his continuous effort which made this event possible i express my thankfulness to our dear participants who cooperated with us in every stage of this academic venture any academic venture conducted in virtual platform requires a lot of technical expertise which has been readily offered to the department of english by the faculties of computer science department of our college they deserves our special thanks i appreciate and thank to all my colleagues students and non teaching staffs of our college for their assistance and efforts and finally thank you to all i thank the organizers too for giving me this opportunity of reaching out to so many people thank you again thank you amrita thank you thank you sir on this note we end our webinar we will it will be circulating the feedback form shortly please please uh, provide us with your feedback thank you